Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. Uh, I'm your host, Doug Sharp. I'm your co-host, Rich Gear, who's trying to keep a straight face. We have some. We always have some fun things going on before the show starts, and uh, I think this will be kind of an interesting show. Um, our cameraman supplied us with our topic of today, and I'm kind of excited Very about nice. it. Very uh, nice. We're going to talk about the, the chemistry of water. Yeah, dihydrogen monoxide. Isn't that what, isn't that what, you, is that what it's called? Well, well, we'll talk about that yeah, later. Yeah, we will. Later, let but, let uh, me read something here, Doug, because I think, I think to me it's fascinating. You think, what could be so interesting about water? It's the most common thing, and yet it's one of the most interesting substances around. I, I'm going to read this litany off here because... And it's very elementary and obvious, but I just think it's kind of nice. Then we can go into the stuff that you want to go into the yeah. chemistry of it and all that. It says, and this is from Wikipedia. It says it is water acted by covalent bonds. You'll get into that a little bit later. Water is a liquid at standard ambient temperature and pressure, but it often coexists on Earth with, it, with its solid state, ice, and gaseous state, steam, water vapor. It also exists as snow, fog, dew, and cloud. This is what I really like, Doug. It says, water covers 71% of the year's surface. So you want to know where Noah's Ark floodwaters went to? They're really mm -hmm. still here, okay? Yeah. Um, it is vital for all known forms of life. On Earth, 96.5% of the planet's water was found in seas and oceans. Now, I didn't know that, okay? Mm -hmm. 1.7 only is found in groundwater. 1.7 is found in glaciers and the ice caps of Antarctica and Greenland. <clears throat> A small fraction uh, can be found in other large water bodies, and, and 0.001% is in the air as vapor, clouds, formed of, ice and, uh, formed of ice and liquid water suspended in air, and precipitation. It says only 2.5% of the year's water is fresh water, and that I didn't know either. Mm -hmm. we got to feel really blessed here in Michigan. 2.5% right, yeah. only is fresh water, and 98.8% .8 of that water is in ice excepting ice and clouds and groundwater. Less than 0.3% of all fresh water is in rivers, lakes, and the atmosphere, and an even smaller amount of the Earth's fresh water, 0.003, is contained within biological bodies and manufactured products. I think that's kind of fascinating, Doug, to see how little fresh water is to be found just readily available. We, we kind of take it for granted here in the that's United right, States, yeah. and here in Michigan especially. So... Um, Doug, you want to talk a little bit about the chemistry of water? I think that's kind of a fascinating. We talked, I yeah, alluded right, to a yeah. little bit, but you uh, know, the, water is essential to life, of course, and uh, you know, that's why uh, these uh, evolutionists keep you know, going out in outer space, uh, uh, sending probes to different planets, to especially Mars. For, yeah, Mars to search for water, and uh, they think they found it on a few other planets, and so they think they've got the beginnings of life. Well. Um, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, yeah. uh, what, what characteristics of, and properties of water make it u uniquely suitable for life? And uh, you talked about uh, covalent bonds between right. hydro two hydrogens <coughs> and one oxygen. The unique characteristics of water is that there, there are covalent bonds that uh, bind the hydrogens, uh, to the two hydrogens to the oxygen. And what that is, is that the electrons uh, are shared by the oxygen and the hydrogen. They sort of rotate around them. And the orbits of them um, sort of form a little uh, orbit around the other end. So uh, there's a polarity that occurs where uh, it has a positive and a negative uh, polarity to it, and it attracts uh, other uh, other water molecules, and that's what co forms the, the the surface tension, the and uh, why it's uh, liquid in the first place. Well, Doug, let me ask a couple of questions. As a guy who was not a very good chemistry guy, he, Doug took chemistry in college. He was a, really into into chemistry when you first started out, and yeah. when you went to college. But it fascinates me, Doug, that two of the most volatile, if you will, flammable atoms or, or molecules, if you had the hydrogen. And oxygen are very flammable. Right. Yeah. But you don't think of flames when you think of water, do you? That's right. You know they. And how in the heck do these two? I don't want to say they're unstable because I don't know if that's quite the technical term, but volatile or whatever. How do how do they come together to share 
an electron? Do they, is it an, if you put a, a couple of oxygen molecules and put a hydrogen in a jar, will, it, will they immediately form together and coalesce into water? Well, pretty much, yes. Really? What will happen uh, is uh, uh, a hydrogen uh, atom uh, wants to share an electron because it's got uh, one extra electron uh, in its orbit. And actually, that's the only electron it has. Is yeah, the, it's only got one. Uh, yeah. and, but, uh, and so it's uh, very willing to give this uh, atom up to so it then becomes stable. Uh, and then the oxygen wants to receive two electrons because uh, it has holes in its orbit for, uh, for extra uh, electrons. And so what happens is that uh, uh, they come together and they're very happy. They, uh, sort of form this stable structure, sort of like uh, neon and argon and uh, the noble gases. The, the, the reason why the, you have these, uh, what they call noble gases, is because they, um, their ob orbits are full, uh, completely of electrons. And so, is that why they're called? No, I never understood why they were called noble gas. I would think of nobility, like well, royalty, it's, it's or because something. they're sort of stuck up and they stick by themselves. <laughs> they, they don't react <laughs> much with anything else. You know? Okay. Uh, okay. All right. That, and and so, uh, actually, what <laughs> happens is that uh, the chemistry is all uh, all about uh, uh, atoms trying to become stable in a way. But this is interesting, Doug, because even you know when you when you say what you're saying, the evolutionist or the scientist or just when you're talking about it, it's almost impossible to not anthropomorphize right. what these non-intelligent things are, these right. atoms, okay, or these molecules, whatever. And I'm going, that's because there is an anthropomorphic source behind why these things do what mm -hmm. they do. I mean, you can't, to me, Doug, how could it be so, per I mean, we've talked about things, for instance, more uh, more um, macro, in the macro e ecosphere, if you will, like how the planet Earth is in the precise place it needs to be in outer space, not be too hot and too cold, mm -hmm. how we have all this water on the planet, you know, where other planets don't have it. Um, but, and the timing of it, but the actual, and I, I guess that's why I sort of understand why evolutionists talk so much about properties inherent in matter that could maybe become a living organism. Of course, we've never seen anything like that. None of the properties inherent in matter can do that. Right. But they do combine, they do share electrons. But again, that seems to be almost, it's, it's, it's such a design thing. Right. It just it seems is. like it's so perfectly set up because I'm going, man, you put a flame to an oxygen uh, molecule or you put a flame to an or a atom and you put a flame to a a uh, uh, hydrogen one, you're going to get fire. You're going to get, boom, it's going to, right? It's just it's not going to, you know, but yet they come together into this wonderful, stable compound that not only is stable, but without it, Doug, as you said in the very first part, we can't live. As beings, That's living right. organisms, we cannot live. And, they, and besides the covalent bonds, they form what's called the hydrogen bond, and it's a unique kind of uh, chemical bond which is much weaker than the covalent bond, but it's uh, what causes it to be liquid because it uh, attracts uh, in this weak, uh, so it sort of uh, attracts but pulls apart and so it's, uh, it's in this liquid state and so it's uh, uh, not as, it's sort of like you know your post-it notes, you know. Yeah. yeah, it's not a, a heavy glue, but it's just sticky enough to where uh, it's useful for the purpose that, uh, that you but have still, it for. still, the fascinating thing about it is, is that it comes in three forms, though. It's mainly liquid, mm -hmm. but when you get cold, and it's not all that cold, like not like hydrogen or, or, or you know, even even oxygen. You got a, a water, you know, you get below a certain temperature, the, it turns into ice. Right, yeah. and it's the only uh, chemical substance known uh, that forms all three states in its, uh, naturally. That's, I mean, think about that, you know, the, the thing we need most in this planet, mm -hmm. it can do all three states, and, and all three states are useful and functional mm -hmm. for us to do what we need to do. I, I, I mean, granted, the liquid, of course, is, I mean, our whole body, what do they say, we're 96%, what are, mm -hmm. what's our body chemistry? How much is composed of water? Is it 98%? No, no, it's, a, it's between 55 and 78%. Water. Oh, is that all it is? I thought it was a lot higher yeah. than that. 
I've always heard like it was 96%. It depends on how much water you drink, Rich. I don't drink enough. But I think yeah. I'll drink some more right now, now that you talk about yeah, it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the other thing that's unique about water is this high surface tension. Uh, you've probably seen the, the water skippers who walk on the water, you know? Yeah, that's, I love that. Yep. Yeah. And then the, there's one other force that is unique to water, and it's, a, it's called the capillary force. And that's uh, the force that draws the water up into plants. Oh, that's and, a different thing? Okay. Yeah, and so it's because of the, of the ca characteristics of water and the surface tension that it uh, actually migrates the water up in, in these uh, little tubes of the, of the plants that, okay. uh, that causes it to be water. And so uh, it's just a unique thing. Now, we can also get on the subject of, uh, uh, of uh, plants and the seeds and all this well, sort of thing. Yeah, and, I know. You know, you have this little pill that you uh, put, put in the ground and it comes up and you got a plant. And, you know, that's really a uniquely designed thing of God but, uh, that we can't reproduce. But. No. no and, I, and you grind up the uh, uh, peanuts and, uh, and then put them in the pill. Is, is, that, is it going to grow? No. No, no. So... Uh, when there's, uh, and it's really the highest of all liquids in terms of... By the way, back to an earlier thing you talked about why they go to all these other planets. They think just finding water is mm -hmm. going to say, well, I found water, therefore life has to be there. Well, you know, in the song of Old Porgy and Bess, well, they were kind of, he was kind of coming against some of the biblical stories in that show, but in, in this evolution, it ain't necessarily so. Yeah. What, I'm get, what I'm getting at is, is, is that is, is that uh, uh, the water in its own form, we need it to live, it's so useful, yet Doug, it's very destructive. It, do, it almost prevents life from happening. In, if, mm -hmm. if, it was, if things are trying to combine, it's so corrosive in a lot of respects that, that it prevents the thing we really want, you know what I'm saying, from happening. And it moderates our climate. Uh, because uh, well, what, yeah. we have, uh, it's the highest of all liquids in the surface tension, conduction of heat, the heat capacity, and it's actually the highest at, uh, for solids as well. Uh, uh, it's the what, do you, what do you mean in, the highest for solids as well? What uh, is that? The highest in heat capacity for ice. Really? Okay. And, and so you have, uh, and it sort of acts as a buffer uh, for the temperatures. So in, if you have a place where there's a lot, not as much water, like in a desert, mm -hmm. you're going to have uh, a wider range of, t uh, of temperature fluctuation because there's not enough water to... Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, you go out there, go out in the Mojave Desert out there out west here, and I've, I've been there during the day, and it's like 140 degrees, about died, didn't have air conditioning in my car one year. Mm -hmm. And at night it drops to about 30 or 40. I mean, it really it drops like 80 degrees or or maybe even 100 degrees in, in, uh, from, mm -hmm. from, the, from the daylight to the nighttime, you, you're, you're shivering at night. In the day, you try not to get heat stroke, you know? Right. So mm -hmm. that, and that's water. And that's true here, although I gotta tell you, sometimes, you know, we always complain about the humidity, both in the winter mm -hmm. and summer, Doug. It seems like sometimes it holds the cold in longer, but it also gets the heat feeling hotter if it's right, really yeah, right, wet right. outside. It makes, you, it makes you feel hotter than it is. So anyway. So and what else you want to go on, Doug? Uh, another interesting thing is that, uh, have you ever tried to compress water? That well, that's what hydraulics is all about. It's hydraulics. Yeah, yeah. if you put it in a con container, the container will burst because the water cannot be, it'll push it up or out or do whatever it's going to mm -hmm. do. And that's, that's the neat thing about how, why mm -hmm. hydraulics does work, you know. Yeah, you can't, you can't. It's going to be as what it is. It's not, right. yeah. Yeah, I've, uh, I saw a little bit of that last week. Uh, I was uh, over at my uh, father's house and cleaning up my father's uh, estate, getting it ready right. for sale, and uh, I heard a noise down the basement, and apparently the water meter had burst. And, oh, and no. And so uh, it filled up the, uh, there was an area where the, uh, the, the water meter was. And yeah. Uh, a little room back in there, and I opened up the door to that, and was greeted with a wall of water. And no, really? <laughs> I didn't hear about this story. Oh, this oh that's was, good. Uh, 
Wow! And, and so uh, <laughs> I had my fill of water this week, you know. Uh, and uh, the neighbor comes over, he get, had his boost, and he was able to turn, shut the water off, and then, and then the brother Steve comes over with a pump, and uh, he... Sounds like the time when uh, my friend John, who's actually here in the audience, we tried to mm. try to solder a, a well, a, a water thing, and he kept telling me, okay, turn the water on. Mm. <laughs> no, turn it off, turn it off. <laughs> yeah. we, could, we couldn't get that thing, because you talk about regulating, the, the the pipe we couldn't get it we couldn't get it warm enough to be yeah. the, the, the solder because the water kept cooling it out but it was funny but yeah he got he got his fill of water that week you yeah. know <laughs> now you can conduct an experiment with water you can take a, a balloon and a water uh, fill it with water get a water balloon yeah and then uh, take a match and put it underneath the water balloon and uh, uh, it isn't going to burn a hole in it it's going to just uh, no really. Uh, because the water cools, water, water will cool it. Yep. Wow. And and from uh, and there's a little thing in here about the effects on life. And uh, I'll read this. It says, from a biological standpoint, water has many distinct properties that are crit critical for the proliferation of life that sets it apart from other substances. It carries out this role by allowing organic compounds to react in the ways that ultimately allow replication. All forms of known forms of life depend on water. Water is vital both as a solvent in which many of the water body's solutes dissolve and as an essential part of many metabolic processes within the body. Metabolism is the sum, sum total of anabolism and uh, catabolism. In anabolism, <laughs> water is removed from molecules through energy requiring enzymatic chemical reactions. <coughs> In order to grow larger molecules, like uh, starches, uh, uh, triglycerides, uh, proteins for storage of fuels and information. In catabolism, water is used to break bonds in order to generate smaller molecules, uh, like in glucose, fatty acids, uh, amino acids, to uh, be used for fuel for energy use. And with water, without water, these processes couldn't exist. And Please, you, said the problem. you said catabolism? C A T A B O L I S M. Yeah, I'm glad it wasn't cannibalism. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So I just was trying to. Well, uh, it's uh, uh, using water as uh, uh, it inserts water or it uh, removes water. Okay. Anabolism is removing water, uh, catabolism is uh, inserting water to break, break things okay. apart. And uh, life is uh, a dynamic process where you have things continuously doing this sort of thing. Um, you need both the removal and the addition yeah, of water, so depending on what the could, process uh, is going to be. If you isolate a protein by itself um, uh, and uh, get its a crystalline X-ray structure, uh, what you have is something that's dead <laughs> because uh, it doesn't it doesn't have that dynamic part of it, you know. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's continuously in use. Uh, every substance that's in your body is continually being uh, broken down or uh, brought together for s specific purposes. And this, it's really an amazing things. Uh, and uh, there's also hydrogen bonds within the protein molecule itself. And uh, uh, the... Okay. the uh, essence for understanding how proteins work is understanding these weak bonds. You know, there's like van der Waals forces, uh, uh, there's uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic bonds, which means that... Uh, this is all water stuff. It's all water stuff. Okay. Uh, if something is hybrid hydrophobic, it means it doesn't like water. Right. If it's hydrophilic, it likes water. And so you have uh, structures conformed in the three-dimensional shape based upon uh, what water does to it and, uh, and its reaction to water, whether it likes it or doesn't like it. it uh, what makes it like it or not like it? I, that's always it. Well, it's, it's all this has to do with this uh, polarity that the hydrogen bond forms. And uh, it, uh, it's an attraction 
and it's uh, and it's uh, it, it attracts and it repels and based repels upon okay. uh, this uh, uh, property of water. And all of these things are just used. <coughs> we don't even think about them, but they're mm -hmm. used just hundreds and thousands of mm -hmm. times every day in the human body and every other living system. They're these kinds of processes to break down mm -hmm. sugars, break down fats, to break down or, or to to make them be used for energy. Is, is that water used right. for all of that kind of stuff or? I'm, right. I, I'm just, I, I just, it fascinates me because I, I realize how, how really I don't know anything about it at all. In fact, <clears throat> I mean, it, when we talk about it, it sounds like, boy, you know everything right. about water. But I mean, sounds, we haven't even talked about acids and bases and uh, uh, pH and, uh, you know, how all in that water, works. Yeah. In water, yeah. yeah. And if you took, uh, I know that uh, I've seen some chemistry books on water alone that are like this thick. It tells all of its characteristics and what it does wow. in terms of uh, its uses and uh, and you know it's a universal solvent almost. It, it dissolves we said earlier, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, it, there's only a few things that uh, um, uh, are strong enough to break the uh, water bonds. Oh yeah, and, and uh, what are those? And uh, this is something uh, we used to do in chemistry class. We would take, uh, uh, make a big bowl of uh, water like this and then yep. uh, get out uh, a piece of metallic sodium and cut off a piece of it and uh, drop it in the water and go bang, 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 bang. Because uh, it's, re it's uh, replacing uh, sodium with uh, one of the hydrogens and it's releasing the hydrogen and the hydrogen gets hot enough so it explodes. It's really little, really? Yeah. I, now that would be, now, oh, I wish I'd have known that when I was a kid. Oh, that was this fun stuff. And there's uh, like s several, uh, lithium, sodium, uh, potassium, uh, uh, calcium, and cesium are all uh, metals. They're highly reactive and they're, uh, uh, they're the kind that wants to give away uh, electrons. Okay. And so they're actually stronger than hydrogen in that uh, sense. And so it forms uh, sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. So why do you think God would have made it something like, I mean, are those u useful to know, to do those kinds of, I mean, it sounds like fun, but are there, are there things that Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> a lot of times uh, uh, that's a good way to make uh, lye, which is uh, sodium hydroxide. Okay. And, a cleanser. Yeah. Okay. I just curious is that you know, like you got these things. Is like, why would why would God make the the bonds real strong, but not totally like the strongest thing? So, anyway, I just well. Well, I'm going to get into something that's kind of fun here. All right. What do you want to get uh, into? Uh, I guess uh, some uh, character in I think it was a high school student uh, put together this uh, old joke. He talked about the dangers of dihydrogen monoxide. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, uh, he, uh, here you were, where he to took all the features of water and took, turned them into alarming statistics. Well, that sounds like global warmers, doesn't it? Yeah, he says that this is fire retardant. retardant. Yep. Uh, they're using it in food and uh, all sorts of things <laughs> and, uh, as a dangerous chemical, and it can cause death by inhalation. And prolonged exposure of the solid form causes tissue damage. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. The gaseous form causes severe burns. It leads to corrosion of metals. It's a major, major component of acid rain. Oh, boy. Uh, contributes to soil erosion. It's found at biopsies of precancerous tumors and lesions. And it's an industrial solvent and coolant. It's used in nuclear power plants. You know, using the production of styrofoam, using biological and chemical weapons. This is the worst thing ever. And uh, it re reacts violently, explosively with common, common sodium. <laughs> it's an additive to food products, you know. And so, so putting it in your food chain. Yeah, this is the horrible stuff. And so uh, that's... Uh, and so it's all one big joke, you know. But everybody's uh, probably, was there anybody that didn't oh, know? There was a whole website dedicated to this. Really? Uh, okay. Uh, they were trying to petition Congress to ban high oh, hydrogen monoxide. Those pencil necks, they probably would <laughs> fall for it. They're so, de so, they're so ignorant sometimes. Uh, 
The only thing good about Hollywood dumb people is they have no power to legislate because mm-hmm. th- those guys go into Congress and some of those guys don't have the brain. mm-hmm. brains God gave little green apples yeah. and they would probably fall for that, not really as it, realizing it's a joke. But still, mm-hmm. that is pretty good. Dihydrogen monoxide, it's just like, because people immediately think carbon monoxide. Or, right, yeah. I'm thinking something like that. And dihydrogen, oh my gosh, that's got to be bad. So, mm-hmm. But Doug, really, when you get right down to it, it's really amazing. The, the water, which really in and of itself is a corrosive, would prevent <coughs> life from evolving by itself. Right. Yet without it, Doug, we cannot live. Right. We can, uh, what, all living organisms, all living things have water in it. You know, we, we cannot... We cannot, we cannot survive without it. You, yeah, we can you know. talk about the dilemma of uh, the formation of the first life because water uh, is essential for it, but it's also uh, a hindrance for a prevent- it. Preventative for it happening. Because uh, in order to combine amino acids uh, together to form life in the protein, you need to remove water, and you need that mechanism already in place um, of, the, of the proteins and the... DNA and the ribosomes, all that needs to be in place in order for uh, that process to work. And the, th- and the big component of, of, uh, of water, of course, is, is oxygen, mm-hmm. which was in, impregnated. We found it's in the, all the er- lowest granites and basalts, they found oxygen in them. So you right. know, it's, it's like that really, really begs the question how life could have yeah. ever started. You and know, uh, one other characteristic of water that uh, is very interesting and essential to life is that it, it uh, is the only substance we know that expands when it freezes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so uh, it's the densest at the 4 degrees centigrade, just before it freezes. But when it uh, actually freezes, it becomes less dense, and so it floats to the top. If it didn't do that, it would, uh, it, you'd have your lakes completely solid and uh, life could not exist. Isn't that interesting? That's fascinating. Well, we hope that you enjoyed our time uh, underwater. Underwater. Uh, Keep your heads above water. Hey, yep. Culligan, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we'll, we'll see you next time on Revolution Against Evolution.